not directly related to calculus while we're waiting. So this is part three of the lectures as we're waiting for two people. We'll make them fill out when they get in. <laughs> and right now we'll just do uh, a big nose in math. You know, so there's, you know, what's the biggest no? What are you not allowed to do in math? Divide, by, right. divide by zero, okay? So we know you can't divide by zero. And we know we have to be careful with infinity. Infinity plus infinity, what does that equal? Is that okay? Plus They're both plus infinity. They're both plus infinity. So still, very so, still so that's okay. Infinity times infinity. That's okay. Infinity minus infinity. That's not okay. Mm -hmm. It depends. Yes. Zero it times depends infinity. Depends. depends. So what I will do is proof. Zero times infinity equals negative one. <laughs> it's not quite as nice as Euler's formula e to the i pi equals negative one, but actually then, since e to the i pi equals negative one, as an immediate corollary, we get zero times infinity is e to the i pi. Okay, are we ready for proof that zero times infinity equals negative one? Okay, so I'm going to draw approximately a circle. So let's take two lines going through the circle. Here's my first line. Here's my second line. And the slopes are m1 and m2. What do we know about the product of slopes of perpendicular lines? <laughs> the negative one. So we know that m1 times m2 equals negative 1 for perpendicular lines. So this is a joke cell. So then the question is, how would you prove this? So one thing is, if you use all the complex numbers we've been talking about, I'll leave this as an exercise. You know, let's say this angle here is theta. So you could write this point here as cosine theta, sine theta. And now for this point over here, this is theta plus pi halves. So this would be the point uh, cosine theta plus pi halves, sine theta plus pi halves. And now we can calculate the slope. The slope of this will be sine theta over cosine theta. So m1 would be sine theta over cosine theta. Now for M2, I guess the other point is, is just zero, zero, right? Would be sine of theta plus pi halves over cosine of theta plus pi halves. Can you get your one inches backwards? Um, yes. It's easy to relabel them like this. So we'll call this one two. And now in a remarkable streak of foreshadowing, earlier today we did angle addition formulas. So the sine of theta plus pi is the sine of theta cosine of pi halves plus the cosine of theta the sine of pi halves. So the top is just going to be the cosine of theta because the, the cosine of pi halves is zero. For the bottom, we have cosine of theta cosine of pi halves, which is zero, minus the sine of theta sine of pi halves. So we have a minus sine of theta. And so now we see that m1 times m2, the sines cancel, the cosines cancel, <coughs> and left with a negative one. So this is a nice way to prove that the product of the slopes of two perpendicular lines is equal to negative one. So if you look at what's going on, I have two lines like this. The product of their slopes is negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one, undefined, negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one. So the slopes are undefined when one line is horizontal and one line is vertical. What's the slope of the horizontal line? What's the slope of the vertical line? 
So zero times infinity is negative one. So in this particular case, that's the correct way to define zero times infinity. Whenever you have infinities, you have to be careful. What do we mean by the product of the slopes here? Well, since it's negative one everywhere else, I have a function that's defined as negative one everywhere with this one point. Let's just make it negative one there so it's a continuous function. So it all comes down to when you're doing limits like this, you can have things blowing up but compensating. So is that proving or is that just, just let's just, let's just call it that. What it's saying is in this case, what we mean by zero and what we mean by infinity would come as negative one. So for instance, imagine I'm giving you the limit as x goes to zero of x times negative one over x. If I look at what's going on, well, at every moment in time, this is the limit as x goes to zero of negative one. And so it's just always gonna be negative one. What I'm, what I want to do is I want to then interpret this as saying the limit of a product is the product of the limits. And I want to say this is the same as the limit as x goes to zero of x times the limit as x goes to zero of negative one over x. And I can't do that. The limit of a product is the product of the limits only if both limits exist. This limit doesn't exist. And that's why I have to be careful and I can't do it like this. So zero times infinity is not really negative one. It depends on what you're looking at. I'm really talking about something like x times negative one over x and taking the limit. I could have had x times negative two over x and I'd get negative two. I could have had x squared times negative one over x and then I'd get zero. Or I could have had x times negative one over x to the fourth and then I would get infinity. So you really think that when you're talking about you're doing something because all the normal right. and indeterminate forms on the, on the Right, and at any moment in time, as long as x is not zero, this makes sense. So this is just to prove that the zero times infinity can be negative one. If you're looking at the product of slopes of perpendicular lines, the product of the slopes is negative one, and then if it's negative one, right when I get here, one slope is zero, one slope is infinity. And how should we interpret zero times infinity? In that case, we can interpret it as just negative one. Okay, so what I want to shift to next is the problem that turned me into a mathematician. So when I was an undergraduate, when I was a sophomore, I was taking a course in real analysis. And the book we use is a very famous book. It's Rudin's Principles of Mathematical Analysis. It's called either the Blue Book, because it has a blue cover. Yeah, we're not that original in our field. Mm -hmm. Or it's called Baby Rudin. Papa Rudin, or Big Rudin, or Green Rudin. It's his green book on real and complex analysis. These are very standard books that are used in a lot of schools all over the country. And this was the first time I ever saw Newton's method. I don't know if you've seen Newton's method to approximate things. Mm -hmm. So this leads to fractals. Uh, it's one of the best applications I know of tangent lines. So, the goal is to calculate things like square roots. Before we go to square roots, uh, let me start off with a little bit more elementary mathematics and talk a little bit about how you do operations and then work our way up to something as hard as a square root. Okay? Uh, I assume all of you have students who are comfortable with their multiplication tables. <laughs> Most? Okay. How high can they go? The 12s, okay. So they still do, okay, the 11s aren't so bad. And the 12s, you only have a few. So, but I mean, would they be able to immediately rattle off, you know, what is, you know, nine times 12, or would they have to think for a moment? Yeah, I mean, I, I would think as well. I've got the 10s pretty well memorized, but. So, so they're dead, but their legacy lives on the Babylonians. They gave us a lot of uh, numbers that we still use. So, base 60. Why do the Babylonians like base 60? Well, 60 splits many different ways. It has a lot of factors. You can split into twos, into threes, into fours, into fives, into sixties. Not sevens, but you know, not eights, uh, not nines, but tens, twelves, lots of ways of breaking up 60. We have 360 
degrees in a circle. We have 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour. These are really nice numbers to divide. You said your students know it through the tens tables and maybe most of the twelves? Sevens can be decimals. I'm sorry? The sevens can be decimals. The sevens can be decimals? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so imagine you are a young Babylonian scholar training for a career in finance and you need to learn your multiplication table. The Babylonians are base 60. So their multiplication table is 60 times 60 is 3,600. So they have 60 digits? Not 60, uh, 60 symbols. 60 symbols, yeah. yes. And then what they might do is they might do, I don't remember exactly how they do things, they might do things similar to the Romans where you use certain symbols mm -hmm. together to build other numbers. But they had ways to represent it as the basic blocks because they were working base 60. Now, you can basically cut this in half by saying multiplication is commutative. So the order doesn't matter. Yeah. X times Y equals Y times X. So how many multiplications do we really need to know? 1800. Approximately 1800. It's approximately 1800. It's about half of that. Now, unfortunately, it's not quite 1800. So the first thing is, how many ways can you choose two distinct numbers? 60, the actual answer is I have to choose two distinct numbers from 60. And then I could choose the same number and I could square it. So this would be 60 times 59 over two plus 60. And so you know, what's the best way to multiply this? Well, this is 60, um, 59 halves, plus one, so this is going to be 60 times 61 uh, over two, and so this would be 30 times 60, um, would be zero, one, two, one, two, two. Do I, do I have anything? Oh, wait a minute, oh, this is, does it have any other stuff? Oh, this should be a three, sorry. Three. This should be a three. Because I'm doing it, I'm doing it, um, there it is, so it's going to be three. So be 18 here, there we go, that's right. So there's really 1,830 multiplications to learn. We'd have enough trouble getting our students to do the, on the order of 50 or 55. So the Babylonians had a very clever way of multiplying numbers. So if they needed to multiply x times y, there are two ways you can do this. It's x plus y squared minus x minus y squared divided by four, <coughs> or x times y is x plus y squared minus x squared minus y squared over two. So if you expand this out, you get x squared plus two xy plus y squared, x squared minus two xy plus y squared, the x squared, y squared is canceled. You're left with four x, y up top. You divide by four, you're left with x, y. Similarly here, you're left with two x, y, and you're left with x, y. So instead of just multiplying x and y, what they do is they add x to y, then they subtract x from y, then they square them both, then they subtract, and then they divide by four. Well, in this case, they add x and y squared, subtract x squared, subtract y squared, and then divide by two. So you replace one multiplication with two multiplications, two subtractions, and addition and a division, or uh, two subtractions in addition, three squares, and a division. So they have to know all the squares. So they have to know all the squares. But that's the key. Enough to know squares. So the idea here is the lookup table. So this is one of the big ideas in, in the year. Rather than computing everything, you compute a few key values and you move from that. And so here, the idea is if we just need to know squares, well that's only on the order of 60 things to remember. You know, 
only 60 or maybe even 120 squares. So you know, x plus y could now be a little larger. But that's much better than 1,830. You know, I, I see people, you know, carrying around, you know, notebooks or computers or laptops. You know, imagine carrying around some clay tablets. You're not going to carry all that. But on the order of 60 or 120, that's not so bad. And the idea is you reduce a complicated problem to a lot of simpler problems. And this is one of the big themes in mathematics. It's much better to do a lot of easy things than one hard thing. And so now we just have to store the values of squares and then we can look it up. So this leads to exact answers here. In general, uh, I am old enough that I can say when I was in high school, I was taught how to use trigonometry tables, you know, tables for sines and cosines and logarithms and how you look something up. And then if your angle is not in the list, how do you interpolate between? The easiest thing is, well, I'll just take the value halfway between, or if I'm 30%, I'll take, I'll weight this one by this much, that one by that much, and figure it out. So the idea is you take some known values and you can interpolate between them. And then the interpolation is fast. The pre-computation is expensive, but you save it so you only have to do once. Mm -hmm. So if you want to calculate something like sine or cosine, the computer doesn't have to know all the values. It needs to know a few key values and how to quickly interpolate between them. And that's sufficient. So you know, this gives us you know, how the Babylonians multiplied. So I want to talk a little bit about efficiency of calculations. And then I want to get to how you would take square roots. How many of you have seen Horner's method or Horner's algorithm? Oh, good. This is, this is a fun one. <laughs> As opposed to all the other boring stuff. Right <laughs> so, how, how did the Babylonians get to that square? Like, I I don't know who it was who had the insight to do this. Well, it's an incredible jump. And you know, uh, you have you know Stalin's quote it might have been around World War II. Sometimes you have to take one step backwards to take two steps forward. That it is often easier to do a lot of sub problems that are simple, but then to do one complicated problem in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And this idea of having a lookup table, that you have to have a few key values learned, and then you launch from those. So much of what's going on with our phones and all the stuff around us is just taking stuff like that and just moving from those known points. Mm -hmm. A lot of it now comes down to doing things quickly. Uh, the first computer I remember using was a Timex Sinclair 1000. I don't know if anybody else used that. You had a cassette player that you would hook up to your computer and you would put in a cassette tape and it would take seven minutes to load what was called Flight Simulator. It was really circles and lines, mm -hmm. but it was kind of looked like a plane and you could fly, but it would take seven minutes to load. Mm -hmm. Or you remember the dial-up you know, modems and how mm -hmm. long that took. There is a need to do things quickly. We get frustrated when it takes too long. When you're doing video streaming, you want to be able to send a small amount of information and have the computer at the other end extrapolate the image. And so the way a lot of images work is you, know, you have a screen and it's pixelated. And for each pixel, you have a red, green, blue, triple. If you had to send the values of every single red, green, blue, triple, this would be an enormous amount of information to send. Well, what we could do is, let's just focus on sending just the red triple, the, the red component. If we can figure out how to do red, we can then do green and blue similarly. And so we have values for each of these. <coughs> so if you want, think of this as a function. And at each point, we have an integer between 0 and 255. We have our height. We have how much redness. So what we're going to do is we're going to do essentially a two-dimensional Taylor series approximation. And so instead of using 1x, x squared, x cubed, people often use sines and cosines, or they use other bases of functions. But what you want to do is you have this two-dimensional function that tells you how much red you have at the point x, y. And you want to approximate this function as you know, a sum. Uh, maybe I'll have n goes from minus n to n, a sum m goes from minus m to m, um, I'll say nice function dn 
of x, nice function, dm of y. And then some coefficient here, a and m. And so these are nice functions that the computer, I'm sorry? It's gonna be like the number of terms. So for instance, maybe what I have is I have, I'm gonna use Taylor series, even though we would not use Taylor series, we would use something else. Maybe I have one plus, you know, a, maybe I have a zero plus a one x plus a one zero x plus a zero one y plus a two zero x squared plus a one one x y plus a zero two y squared plus da da da. We wouldn't use those functions, but those are easier ones to just look at. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a finite polynomial. And I can have a polynomial that's going to do a pretty good job of approximating this. And now, rather than sending all the pixels, all I have to do now is I just send these coefficients. And I send those coefficients. And the point is, your computer is not stupid. Your computer has a good processor. Your computer can do a lot of the calculations. So rather than sending all the information, take advantage of the fact that you have a computer that's intelligent. And the computer can then reconstruct this function, the red function, from this. Is it gonna be a perfect reconstruction? No. But you don't need perfect. You need good enough for the human eye. Especially since people are watching things on smaller and smaller devices. You know, the resolution on these screens is not perfect. You know, my son likes to watch you know, sports clips. We watch you know, a lot of baseball sports clips and say, where's the little baseball in this play? You can barely see it. So sometimes you might actually need more resolution on a small device because it's gonna be so hard to see what's going on. But the idea is we just transmit a few numbers and then the computer can reproduce the color image. And what you might often do is you might actually look at the change in red from one moment to the next. Because you know, when you're looking at most movies, things don't change too abruptly. So a lot of this comes down to being able to do math efficiently. So in pure mathematics, we're often just happy if we have an answer. But in the real world, if it takes 14 years to get the answer, this is for the most part not practical. There's a couple of times when we have been in situations where we can actually wait a couple of years for the answer. The best example I know is the Voyager Grand Tour, where the planets align every couple of centuries so that one probe can actually go and visit all the outer planets. The problem is the right time to launch, NASA did not have the technology to build the probe that was required. So they built the best probe that they could, and they were going to reprogram it from Earth later as the technology got better and the programming got better, and they just sent what they could. It's, it's a phenomenal special to watch on, on the Voyager space missions, on the Grand Tour, and just how they were reprogramming and adjusting it from Earth. But they didn't have to have everything solved, they just had to have something good enough to launch, and they could work on the rest as it was traveling, because it's gonna take years to reach its destination. So here, the big theme for this next part of you know, today is how do we do things well and quickly? For the computer, if we can't do these calculations fast, we're in trouble. And what I can do now is I can show you Horner's algorithm, which is something you can do in an algebra class. And so, let's say I give you the following. f of x is eight x to the fifth plus three x to the fourth minus two x cubed plus seven x squared plus nine x minus one and I want to calculate f of two. How would I calculate f of two? Plug in two. Plug in two, right? Mm -hmm. Does anybody, so Horner's algorithm is a faster way to plug this. So let's look at the cost of calculating f of two. How many multiplications does this term take? So this takes not six multiplications. Five. Five. Because x to the fifth, x squared takes only one multiplication. x cubed is two, x to the fourth is three, x to the fifth is four, and then times eight is five. So this costs five multiplications. This costs four multiplications. 
Yes? Three. Three. Cad was pretty clear at this point. Was, was there a question? Or? No, 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 I think it's just about the issue being the last of the three. No. Okay. Now, there's also five additions, or generalized additions, subtraction is generalized addition. Mm -hmm. But addition is cheap relative to multiplication. As the numbers get really, really big, it's much harder to multiply big numbers than to add them. If you have five digit number times five digit number, you have to do on the order of 25 digit operations. Whereas adding is on the order of five. So it's much, much cheaper. So I'm not gonna really worry about the additions. What's five plus four plus three plus two plus one plus zero? Oh, that's the formula we just did earlier, <laughs> right? So it's equal to n, times n plus one over two. So five times six is 30 divided by two is 15. If you don't remember the formula, of course, you can just add five plus four plus three plus two plus one. So this costs 15 multiplications. So the question is, can we do better? And Horner's algorithm is how to do better. It's absolutely beautiful. So this was the cost. So I'm gonna write my function f of x in another way. It's eight x plus three times x minus two times x plus seven, the parentheses are growing, times x plus nine times x minus one. And now if you read, I have 8x, 8x squared, 8x cubed, 8x to the fourth, 8x to the fifth. The next term is 3x, 3x squared, 3x to the fourth. Uh, the next term is going to be negative 2x, x squared, negative 2x cubed, 7x, 7x squared, 9x. So when you expand it out, you have what you had before. One, two, three, four, five, you know, I'm not saving any additions. There's no savings in additions. But how many multiplications? One for here, and then two, three, four, five. So five multiplications. So it's far fewer multiplications. Now, if I have a polynomial of degree five, it's a savings of a factor of three. But we just spent a bunch of minutes doing the birthday problem and trying to see how things scale, mm -hmm. right? So what we really want to know is, well, what would happen if we had a bigger polynomial? So imagine we had, you know, f of x is x to the, this is a d x to the d <coughs> plus dot 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 dot. And if we just do things naively, the multiplication cost would be d plus d minus one plus one plus zero, which is d, d plus one over two, which is approximately one half d squared. Whereas here, doing the by Horner cost, we had a polynomial of degree five, it took five multiplications, the Horner cost is just d so the cost is square root. This is an incredible savings. So as the numbers get really, really large, the fact that I can evaluate this in d steps versus you know, one half d squared steps is phenomenal. And this is what we need to be able to do a lot of calculations quickly. The Newton's method stuff that I'm gonna talk about next leads into fractals, like Mandelbrot set and stuff like that. And if you're interested in stuff like this, the way you do a lot of these calculations is you need to use things like Horner's algorithm to evaluate these polynomials quickly. Uh, anybody remember like 286s, 386s? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm trying to remember. I think I was doing this on like a 486, yeah, yeah. and I was running a program to do to draw fractal images, and it was running slowly but just barely being able to do things in a reasonable amount of time by using Horner's algorithm. Without Horner's algorithm, the computer was too slow for me to actually see anything meaningful. 
So a big theme in modern mathematics is it's not enough to have the answer. You need to get to the answer in a reasonable amount of time. And this is, you know, the earlier you can get students thinking about this, you know, we have calculators and computers that can do all this stuff for us. But you know, do you want to wait for your video to stream? Do you get upset when it stops and has to think again? Yes. Um, although for me, that's when I actually get to talk to my son. <laughs> so there's advantages. That step four, your kids is also going to turn off when you're processing them. Like they know they're reading. So in grad school, I was in grad school um, starting around 96. I had a friend who had a 286. And the reason he had a 286 was no viruses could run on it. Because nobody was making viruses with a 286 anymore. And he was right. Uh, but oh my god, his computer was slow. OK, so this is Newton's method. So I was on the fence between math and physics. And when I saw this problem, I moved to the math side. It's a way to quickly calculate square roots and other more general things. So essentially, all of mathematics is about solving equations. Unfortunately, it's hard to solve problems exactly. So frequently, we get things close. Um, are there aficionados who claim that records give better quality than CDs? Or you might want to see which way it's supposed to go. Are better than CDs. Yeah. Because of the round. <laughs> but so the question is, for most people, can you actually tell the difference between the quality? You know, what's your ability to hear? Now there are some people who have really good ears and they can hear the difference. Just like some people have really good uh, palates and can taste good wine versus bad wine. Um, let me just make sure. I mean, lectures is this important? No. What's what's going on? Okay. Okay. Um, I'll call you in about half an hour. Um, so New Newton's method. So the idea is mathematics is about you know trying to solve equations, and since you can't solve things exactly, trying to approximate things. We're lucky that we have the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula allows us to find the solution to a quadratic polynomial. There is a cubic formula. There is a quartic formula where the roots are nice functions of the coefficients. There is no formula that works for a general degree 5 and higher. So the question is, can we approximate a solution? So I'm going to take a simple problem. Let's find the square root of 3. So we're trying to solve f of x is x squared minus 3. We want to solve that, and we want to set that equal to 0. Now, of course, the solution to this is just x equals plus 3, plus root 3, or minus root 3. But I want to know what is the square root of 3. So here is the square root of 3. And so, can somebody give me a decent approximation to square root of three? Easy one. Easy. <laughs> Easy. I don't want. I want an integer. Two. Okay. I'm hoping you'll agree that 2 is not a great approximation to the square root of 3. Let's guess the square root of 3 equals 2. So we're going to come up with a way to approximate the square root of 3, starting with only a semi-reasonable guess. OK, so the idea is the following. Here's the point 2, and here's the point 2 comma f of 2. Right, because that, that's the point. You know, this is the curve. Y equals x squared minus three. Okay, well, when I put in x equals two, this is the point two comma one. 
The slope at this point is f prime x2. I will, if f of x is x squared minus 3, f prime of x is just 2x, right? We fortunately calculated this earlier today. So what would f prime of 2 be? That would just be 4. So what we're going to do is we're going to write down the equation of the tangent line, and we're going to say that our curve is actually just given by a straight line. And then we're going to see where does the straight line hit the x-axis. And we're going to call that the square root of 3. So let's do the equation of the tangent line. So we have a point, which is going to be 2 comma 1. We have a slope, which is 4. And so the equation of the tangent line is going to be y minus 1 equals the slope times x minus 2. Right? So we get y is equal to 4x minus 8 plus 1 minus 7. So if we hit the x-axis when y equals 0, and then x equals 7 fourths. OK, so our, our first guess was 2. Our second guess, x1, the first real guess, is 7 fourths, which is 1.75. That's not a bad approximation to the square root of 3. Now, this is not going to be perfect. So what we'll do now is the method is called uh, the shampoo method of mathematics. Yep, <laughs> loud and rinse repeat. So here was our initial guess, 2. Here's our next guess, x1 equals 7 fourths. We just play the game all over again. We come back up on the curve, and then we draw. And then it's such a good approximation that it'll be very hard to uh, see the difference between this and the next point. So what I'm going to do now is rather than doing 7 fourths, or if you want I can do 7 fourths or I can just jump to the general step. Let's just jump to the general step. So now, what do we have? We have as a point, we have our previous point, xn, and f of xn. So what is that going to be? xn and then f of xn would be xn squared minus 3. That's our point. And the slope is f prime of xn, which is 2xn. And now we can find the tangent line. So the tangent line is going to be y minus f of xn equals f prime of xn x minus xn. Right. This is the equation of the tangent line going through the point xn f of xn with slope f prime of xn. So we get y is equal to, I'll move this over to the other side, f of xn is xn squared minus 3 plus f prime of xn, which is 2xn, x minus xn. So now we want to find where it hits the x-axis. That's going to be the point y equals 0 and then x equals xn plus 1. So it hits x-axis at xn plus 1 when y equals 0. So we get 0 is xn squared minus 3 plus 2xn xn plus 1 minus xn. Okay? So all we have to do now is solve xn plus 1. So 
So I'll bring this over to the other side as we get you know, 2xn, xn plus 1 minus xn, now the side I brought it over initially, is equal to 3 minus xn squared. I divide by 2xn, and so I get xn plus 1 is equal to 3 minus xn squared over 2xn. Oh, I'm just saying, sorry, this is xn plus 1 minus xn. Well, now I just want to bring the xn over to the other side. And so then I get xn plus 1 is 3 minus xn squared over 2xn plus uh, xn. Hi. You look like you have a question. Yeah. When you when you said the y equals a zero, mm -hmm. can you explain the second term? Which term? Uh, in that line. So yeah. This How one? did it go to n plus one? And well, what I'm saying is. There's a special value of x that corresponds to y being zero. That's going to be yeah, the yeah. next point in my sequence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just like this was yeah. x zero, this is x one, this is now xn plus one. Got it. So now it's just doing some algebra. Okay. Now we get to combine denominators. So you get to show people about multiplying by one. So you multiply this by 2xn over 2xn. You'll have a 2xn squared. We have a minus xn squared. So it becomes a plus xn squared. So we get, as a final result, I'll write it over here, we get xn plus 1 is equal to 3 plus xn uh, squared over xn. <coughs> so a better way of writing this is it's xn plus 3 over xn. And the reason I like to write it like this is you see this is where you were and this is where you moved. So what's nice about this is if you start off with a rational number, all of your subsequent numbers will be rational. They'll all be rational approximations to the square root of 3. There's a lot of math about does this work? Does it get closer? So if you were really, really lucky, what value would you have for xn? Square root of three. So if xn, oh, and I, I dropped, there was a there's a two down, just yeah, there was a two down space. Yeah, you're doing yes. it. Yes, yeah, I know. Wait a minute. Yes. This one. Right. Yep. It's one half of this. So what you're basically doing is you're averaging xn and three over xn. If you happen to be lucky and have the square root of 3, you have square root of 3 plus 3 divided by square root of 3. Well, 3 divided by square root of 3 is square root of 3. So you get twice the square root of 3 divided, you get square root of 3. So if you start at square root of 3, you end at square root of 3. And you stay there for all eternity. This is good. If you happen to guess the right answer, you're not going to move away and go to something that's wrong. Then the hope is that if you are not at the square root of 3, you get closer. Okay, And so what you can do as an exercise is you can then see what would happen if you put in more things. So right now we have uh, 7 fourths. So we can calculate what the next term would be. It would be, so x2 would be 1 half of 7 fourths plus, we have 3 over 7 fourths, which would be 12 sevenths. So this is one half, and uh, it's cross multiply, so it'll be 49 plus 48 over 28. All right, you might remember the 49 from earlier today. All right, 49 plus 48 is uh, 97. You have 97 over 56. Does somebody want to calculate 97 over 56? <laughs> Excellent. 
What's the square root of 3? Yeah. Um, so 1.7320 sub. 1.7320. 5, 0. Okay. So if you look at this point, we have 0, 5 point versus 0 0.04. So our error mm -hmm. is point zero zero zero. 0, uh, 9 approximately. That's not bad, starting with a guess of 2 and just doing it twice. You know, if you look over here, we had you know, about 1 or 2 digits, now we have about 3 to 4 digits. You double the number of digits of accuracy every time you do this. So when you use this, do you use spreadsheets? I use spreadsheets. Um, I normally have a uh, screen that I project that has the numbers there, or I have the numbers written down in front of me, and I just go through this, and I tell everybody, you can change the numbers, you can change the starting point, and you can see how quickly <coughs> it's converging. And it's, it, it's phenomenal how fast it's converging. So as homework, you, know, you should calculate x3 and x4. But if you do, as you said, if you do as a, as a spreadsheet, you have a formula for the next block in terms of the previous. You know, Excel would love something like this. And so you can calculate these very easily. And by the time you do three or four approximations, it's almost perfect. You're not gonna notice the difference. You'll hit the calculator overflow where it won't be able to give you enough digits to tell how much do you deviate from square root three. So to me, this is similar to the birthday problem. It's going back to the power of calculus. You know, all we're doing is we're approximating a complicated function with a straight line. And straight lines are easy to work with. So the question becomes, are there other ways you could have found the square root of three? And so I'll show you one other way. Hopefully it will end just as the pizza arrives and you'll be <laughs> impressed with the incredible, well-prepared timing. But instead of doing the square root of three, if I wanted the square root of five, all that would change is the, the three becomes five. If I wanted the square root of nine, well, really shouldn't be going through this for the square root of nine. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? What if you wanted the cube root of three, or the fifth root of three? All that would change is this function would now have a fifth, and over here, instead of having two xn, I would have something else. And so the algebra becomes a little bit more involved as a nice exercise, so if you're teaching this, you could then ask students, well, what would happen if I wanted the one-third root or the one-fifth root? It's not really worth calculating the two-thirds root because if you can calculate the one-third root, you can square it. So you could, but you, know, you, you can ask those questions as well. So this is Newton's method. I'm gonna show you another method called divide and conquer. Divide and conquer is very uh, popular in a lot of computer science classes. And we'll compare the two. Are you, you covering divide and conquer now? Or? No, I just said my, 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 my thesis title is divide and conquer. Ah. <laughs> okay. So here's the idea. Let's say you have a function that's continuous. And this is where it would have been nice if I actually covered the intermediate value here earlier today. But let's say you have a continuous function. And the function is positive at zero and the function is negative at one. What can you conclude? It it's gotta hit zero somewhere in between. So we divide the interval in half, and let's say it's positive at a half. What can you conclude? Two and a half and one. So there must be a zero between a half and one. What about between zero and a half? I'm sorry? Yeah, Can't tell. So there's a nice yeah. joke a physicist, an engineer, and a mathematician are traveling on a train in the Scottish countryside. And they spot a black sheep. And the engineer, sorry, I'm going to be making fun of engineers. The engineer says, Scottish sheep are black. 
And the physicist says, no, 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 no. You cannot conclude that the Scottish sheep are black. All you can conclude is that this sheep is black. And the mathematician goes, no, 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 no. All you can conclude is there exists at least one sheep in Scotland, which is black on at least one side. <laughs> so you have to be extremely careful in terms of what you are claiming. We know there must be a zero between one half and one, but we don't know about anything else. Now let's take the point three fourths and let's make it negative. So now we know that there's a zero somewhere between a half and three fourths. So this is four eighths, this is six eighths, so I would try five eighths. And if it's positive here, so every time we divide, we divide the size of our integral in half. So the error decreases by a factor of two. So computer scientists do not understand ancient Greek and Latin. How many megabytes are in a gigabyte? We debate this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> what do you debate? This is, there's no debate. The no, number of megabytes in a gigabyte is fixed. It would be 1,000 or 1,024. It's 1,024. So, does that mean one? So, a thousand is almost a thousand twenty four. So computers love base two. So two to the 10 is almost 10 cubed. So what this means is every time we do divide and conquer, we have our error. So every time we do this 10 times, we improve our accuracy by one over 1,000. So we get three more decimal digits every time we do 10 divide and conquers. So what that means is if I wanted to get the square root of three to three digits, I would have to basically be doing divide and conquer three times in the interval one to two. I'm oh, sorry, not three times, 10 times. If I wanted to get another three digits, I would have to do another tip about 20 times. Newton's method, basically every time you do it, you increase the number of uh, digits of accuracy by doubling. So if somebody has a calculator or computer right now, what we can do is we can just plug in 97 56 So we would have we just calculated x2, so x3 would be 1 half uh, 97 56 plus 56 97. So it would be 97 squared. Oh, oh no, 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 sorry, but it's going to be 3 divided by that. So it's times 3. Plus 3 times 56 squared over 2 times 56 times 97. So that should be our next approximation for um, x3. I think I forgot to print out, yeah, I, I had calculated these ahead of time, but I think I forgot the piece of paper. And so the question is, how many more digits are we going to get from that? And so we have square root of three was 1.732058. And that is what, 1.73. Okay, so x, so x3. Yeah, 1.732. 1.732. All right, so now I have to go back to the people who calculated the square root of three and say I need more digits. <laughs> With just three approximations, one, two, three, four, five, six, I'm getting at least seven digits correct. It's phenomenal how well Newton's method works. This is something, as, as you said, you can do with spreadsheets. You can show it to the students. This is the power of calculus. This is the power of approximating a nonlinear function with a linear function. And then what you do is you do your approximation, you see where you land, and then you correct. And then you do your next approximation, and you see where you land, and you correct. And you keep going like that. And so, one of the big questions is, why does Newton's method beat the crap out of divide and conquer? It's not even close. I mean, divide and conquer, I would need 20 operations to get six digits. With three operations, I've got seven. And the further you go, the worse divide and conquer loses. So it's worth stepping back and thinking, you know, divide and conquer is, is 
a nice method. You know, I hear some people even write you know feces based on it, <laughs> or it's cousins. <laughs> it's got to have something going for it that Newton's method doesn't. So it's worthwhile being very explicit in what are you assuming. If I want to do Newton's method, what do I need to use? Differentiable, differentiable functions. I need to know differentiability. I need to know calculus. Not all functions are differentiable. Or not all functions have derivatives we understand. All I need to do here is be able to determine are you positive, are you negative, or are you zero. So the amount of information you need to make divide and conquer work is significantly less than the amount of information you need to make Newton's method work. But it has to be continuous. Well, if you're, if you're differentiable, then you have to be continuous. No, but for your divide and conquer. Divide and conquer, you have to be continuous. That's all you need. Yes. So divide and conquer needs a continuous function. Newton's method needs a differentiable function. So is it reasonable that if you assume more, you can do more? Yeah. So Newton's method is better because it's using more knowledge of the function. But it does not apply to as many situations as divide and conquer. So there are some times where uh, in modern mathematics, we actually look for sign changes of a function. And the function is very complicated. We don't really have a good form of its derivative. And we can use the sign changes to find where the zero is. Okay, so what I like about this problem is it's a nice application of calculus and it really emphasizes the need to do things efficiently. And you know, I hope that means lunchtime. Uh, Sarah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, so. Jill's coming down. You can send. You can send her towards the main stairs if you want. Or All right. So this is. 